Okay, Servus, guten Morgen. Wie geht's Ihnen? How's everyone doing? Okay, I'm sorry. I know it's early, but what is this? Are we at Drupal Dev Days? Come on, how's everybody doing? Good? <laughs> There we go. One more time. How's everyone doing? Okay, that's more like it. That's more like it. Well, um, here we are, the second day of Drupal Dev Days. Um, hopefully, everyone is feeling uh, really good after a nice rest. Um, no, no, no. I'll, yeah, I'll just stick with the handheld. Thank you. Um, all right. So, uh, Servus, guten Morgen. Um, mein Name ist Preston So. Und ich wohne in New York, in den uh, USA. Es ist eine große uh, Freude, hier heute mit Ihnen zu sein. Uh, thank you so much for having me. My name is Preston So. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here, um, here at Drupal Dev Days once again. Um, I know for some of us it's been a very long time since we've last seen each other in person. So this is a keynote called Human Machines and Machine Humans. This is a very different talk from the talks that I've given in the past. Um, I was last at Drupal Dev Days to keynote five years ago, and I was talking a little bit about the future of Drupal and where Drupal is headed. But that theme was stolen this year by our good friend Alexander here, so I couldn't speak on that topic this time around. But this time, I wanted to talk a little bit about something that goes away from technology a little bit that goes away from the code, that goes away from how we think about Drupal, how we think about technology, how we think about code and architecture, and focuses more on the architecture and the code that defines who we are as humans, that defines who we are as humanity, and that ultimately is the reason why we are all building technology and building websites in the first place. Because if you think about it, we are all, at the end of the day, human. We are all, at the end of the day, machines as well, given that we operate using a variety of, mecha of, of, of mechanisms and mechanics that define how we live organically and breathe organically. But our machines are also now increasingly becoming humans. We now see, of course, a huge amount of development happening in artificial intelligence. I know there will be another keynote about that tomorrow morning. But today I wanted to take a step back and take a look at How exactly are all of these things that are happening today in the world and soon to happen in the future things that give us pause when it comes to who we are? But first, let me ask a question. How many people are scared of what's happening right now in technology? I'm going to be honest with you. I am terrified. I am terrified. I am absolutely terrified because not just do we see the impact of all of these new innovations in our day-to-day -day workflows and our websites and our technologies? We're also seeing these things happen in the world around us. Before I begin, though, let me introduce myself one more time. Uh, my name is Preston So. I've been in the Drupal community for 16 years, um, and it's been a real pleasure to come to, to Drupal Dev Days so many times and to hang out with so many of you, and I'm very excited to meet more of you uh, today as well. I work um, today especially on the intersections of content, design, and code. What that means is what I focus on is how content, especially in the context of CMS, and design in the context of user experience, and of course code and architecture intersect. I was just recently at Oracle. Before that, I was at Gatsby.js, and before that, I was at Acquia. I also run a conference of my own. Um, we've had actually several people here in the room have been to Decoupled Days. Decoupled Days is the Decouple Drupal or Headless CMS conference. We're the only nonprofit headless content and commerce conference in the entire world. This year, we're going to be in Albuquerque, and we have a really special announcement this year, which is that if you would like to win a free ticket, a free round trip, and a free hotel room to come and join us next month in August, you can actually register uh, at this URL on the left-hand side for free. And thanks to our two sponsors, Uh, Vercel and Orium, um, one lucky person will be able to have an all-expenses-paid trip to join us in Albuquerque. Tickets are only $25. Early bird pricing is over, but we are still going to keep our pricing at $25 um, for our nonprofit event. 18 great talks, two days, a single track this year in this seventh edition uh, presented by our presenting sponsor, Highgraph, this year. 
formerly Graph CMS. So hope you can join us and find out more at uh, decoupleddays.com. I've also written several books. Um, some of the information that I'm going to be talking about today is in these books. I've written three books, or four books actually, uh, Immersive Content and Usability, which is currently available right now, and a book apart just announced a little while ago that um, these books are now available on Amazon, Bookshop, um, your local independent bookstore. Here in Europe as well, they're available. You no longer have to get international shipping from the US, so you can find those online. I've also written the, the first uh, comprehensive developer's handbook to Gatsby JS. Unfortunately, as with all of these books, it is a little bit out of date now that Gatsby is in V5, but you can still find some good information about Gatsby in there, including about how to integrate it with Drupal. I've also written a book called Voice Content Usability, another one from a book apart. Um, and you might also know me from uh, my first book, Decoupled Drupal in Practice, which was one of the first books out there about headless Drupal. So I want to ask a question today which really toys with some of the ideas around artificial intelligence that we've seen emerge recently. And that is, what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be a living and breathing human being? And where does the line end with not being human? What does it mean not to be human? What does it mean to still be a machine, especially today as the humans and machines in our midst become ever more indiscernible from each other, ever more indistinguishable from each other? Just as, why we, just as the way that we rely on each other here in this room, here at this conference, in our families, in our friend groups, to tell us how to be human, how to act human, how to, how to, act human, how to be uh, human beings, we're relying increasingly more and more on machines to tell us how to be human as well. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? And are there ways that we can think about this problem that can help us in the future avoid some of the things that we've already seen emerge in realms like artificial intelligence, the metaverse, and other technologies? Fundamentally, as I said before, we are all machines. We're all breathing gears and cogs all built to, f to serve a single purpose, which is to further the human species. But we are also now conferring all these benefits, or not benefits, let's say these curses, on the machines that we are increasingly programming to be just like us. But what does that mean, just like us, when we actually tell a machine that it has to be just like us, that it has to behave just like us, speak just like us, look just like us, and in the end, act just like us. Today I'm going to talk about three areas of technology today that are increasingly worrisome in these realms of all of the things that we talk about as humans. When it comes to justice, when it comes to equity, when it comes to inclusion, when it comes to accessibility, when it comes to how we interact with each other in our spaces and in our environments today. I want to talk first and foremost about avatars because I think that's a very good entry point into how we think about the ways in which the computer world and the whole internet and all of the digital landscape that we now face has actually impacted how we perceive ourselves and how we perceive our sense of self. I also want to talk about assistance, voice assistance, these things that we now have invading our homes, these things that we now have in our living rooms, and how they affect how we are now perceiving each other as humans. I want to talk about artificial intelligence. I know there's going to be a much larger talk about this tomorrow, so I'm not going to talk about it too much because I want to make sure that there's space for tomorrow. But I do want to talk a little bit about how AI, and particularly generative AI, is impacting how we perceive everyone and how we perceive the human species and the world in general. And then finally, I'm going to talk about what we should do, what we can do, what we're able to do to confront some of the really distressing things that have emerged from these patterns. So to begin here, the reason I've asked this question is because there's a variety of different meanings when we think about the word human. Being human is to be, in a lot of senses, the most perfect species that has existed on this planet, the most developed species that has existed on this planet. But it also means to be one of the most deeply flawed and one of the most deeply problematic species on this planet, and that has perhaps ever existed. There's two words, for example, where the word human or the term human appears in a very important way, which is the term humane. How do we treat each other humanely? How do we treat our animals humanely? How do we treat this world humanely? And of course, when we talk, when we talk about treating each, other, uh, treating each other humanely, we have to talk about humanitarianism. 
and how we treat each other in a just and fair and righteous way. What does it mean not to be human? Well, some might argue that some of these terms here are actually very much what it means to be human. In this world today, we see a huge amount of inhumane actions going on. We see a lot of dehumanization going on, a lot of exploitation going on, oppression going on, whether that means misogyny or sexism, whether that means anti-blackness or racism, whether that means queerphobia or transphobia or ableism. Today, those things are just as much a fixture of what it means to be human as all of the other things that define us as human, our achievements, our goals, our ability to think for ourselves, our ability to create vast cities and vast infrastructures, the likes of which may never be seen again on Earth. The problem is, though, that the machines that we build, they don't really care about these problems, right? They don't really care about who we are and how we treat each other as human beings because they're fundamentally machines. They're just binary ones and zeros. They are based off of things that are physically rooted. They're not things that have a sense of humanity, that have a consciousness, that have a way of thinking. Until now, of course. The machines that we build don't act out of or care about the oppression and the problems that we have in this world today unless we make them. And boy, are we making them think about oppression and uh, engage in oppression today. Uh, in this world right now. We are inadvertently extending biases into what we build and how we think about these machines that we build. And when we do so, we're actually diminishing our own humanity. We're actually reducing our capacity to be human, to be righteous, to be just, to be good human beings. And this is the question I want to pose today as a key kind of turning point for all of the way, uh, for the entire way that we think about technology, which is, how similar exactly does our technology, how similar do machines have to be to us as humans, including the parts of us that we don't like very much, the parts of us that reflect the worst aspects of humanity to be considered human? And it's unrealistic or overly utopian to want machines that don't have the same biases, that don't have the same violent behaviors that we have as humans, or is that simply a pipe dream? Because our sense of self, our sense of each other, is increasingly out of our control. We're seeing a virtuous cycle where the bias that we encode into our own machines and what we build is creating a feedback loop that comes back into us and only reasserts our own bias and our own oppression that we inflict on others. We're letting a lot of things take over um, when it comes to machines, especially aspects of humanity that I believe are things that we should really treasure. For example, avatars are now becoming the ways in which we interact with our identity and our individuality. How many people here have Bitmojis on their, on their iPhones, right? A few here, right? How many people have tried Second Life in the past? Okay, we've got some Second Life players in here. How many people have tried anything that Meta has come out with? The, uh, yeah, okay, a few people here. So my question that I want to ask uh, in this first part that I'll get to in a little bit is how have those sorts of great expressions of our identity actually serve to potentially limit how we think about our identities. We think about assistance as well, Siri, um, Alexa, all of these things that are very important to our daily lives now, but are fundamentally rooted in what exactly we do to provide each other with services, to, pro to, pro to provide each other with support, with information. How have our assistance and how have those devices served to change the way that we think about ourselves and each other? Of course, now we have artificial intelligence. These services like MidJourney, ChatGPT, so many of these services that now are really questioning and putting into doubt some of the ways that we've thought about art, creativity, and imagination for so long. There's a couple of things I'm not going to talk about today, um, which are very important as well, but I think other people have spoken about these ideas in a very, very clear way, especially the ways in which social media algorithms affect our self-esteem and self-image. I'm not sure if many of you know this, but in the United States, we are currently facing one of the biggest mental health crises in our entire history. Um, adolescent teenage girls are facing unprecedented pressures and challenges when it comes to mental health. Almost half of them have reported feeling sad or lonely or depressed over the past three to six months. And this is partially because of how our social media algorithms and how the ways in which we express our self-esteem online and our self-image online are dictating increasingly how we think about ourselves and how we think about each other.
And then finally, we're also dealing with a lot of issues around surveillance. The credit score that exists within the uh, People's Republic of China, for example, social credit score, um, active surveillance that occurs in Europe and in the United States to track criminal behavior. These things are creating a very interesting debate that has been ongoing for many centuries about what it means to be a fair and just society. Let's talk about the three first things that I posted, uh, that I posed as issues, though. We've got avatars, which in its most clinical definition are graphical or three-dimensional representations of a person. Could be a photo, could be an emoji, could be an icon, which is the case back in the day when we back had, when we back had you know, bulletin boards and forums. Or they could be metaverse avatars that are fully fledged characters with or without legs, right? We also have assistants, voice assistants, AI assistants. These are devices or interfaces that can perform tasks on behalf of a person. That's a very interesting definition, by the way. I want to come back to that. And then finally, artificial intelligence is the simulation or the extension of a person's human intelligence or human capacity to do certain things or to, do, uh, to engage in certain activities. So these are the issues that are most at stake. When we give more and more of ourselves, of our humanity, to the machines that are in our midst, what does that mean? Well, first and foremost, I want to start with avatars because they're really interesting from a philosophical standpoint. Avatars influence very deeply how we perceive ourselves and how that perception can actually serve to harm us. What happens when we allow these machines to define how we perceive ourselves in this very deep way? There's one very good thing about avatars. Um, I asked why people have played Second Life before um, or how many people have played MMORPGs before because there's one very, very good thing about these avatars that we see in our midst. If anyone has uh, interacted with somebody online, for example, and this is a very big plot point in Ready Player One, the movie as well, uh, many times the avatars that we present on these online worlds, in these MMORPGs, these games, are not how we present in the real world. And for many people, that is a, that's actually something that is a source of safety. If you're somebody who lives in a queerphobic or transphobic society where it is very difficult to come out as LGBTQ or to come out as trans, being able to live your full identity online in a virtual setting can be incredibly freeing and can be incredibly self-actualizing in a way that can't possibly exist in our very queerphobic and transphobic world, especially in societies and countries where it's very difficult to be LGBTQIA+. So this is a very good thing. Avatars have done something very, very good, and virtual spaces have been proven by multiple research studies to actually help those who are LGBTQIA or gender questioning or um, otherwise questioning in societies that are less forgiving and also in settings like schools or in settings like um, teenage environments. But there's also a darker side to avatars. Can avatars, in fact, be limiting for some, be actually something that is not freeing? And I think we actually see this quite a bit when we think about how social media has impacted the way that we think about our self-image. Everyone remembers laughing at this, right? Legs are coming soon from Mark Zuckerberg. Um, I actually love this because it's one of those things that kind of <laughs> just kind of jabs at how ridiculous our society has become in some ways. Legs are coming soon, and that's a big announcement. Um, but the thing is, look at these two avatars here, right? What do you notice about them? We've got Mark Zuckerberg, right? who really kind of looks a lot like Mark Zuckerberg in real life, right? I mean, it's not really much of a difference when you think about the fact that his hair really does look like that. He really does wear clothes like that. But the thing is that avatars, because of their simplification of human appearance, because of their actual diminishment of who we are in terms of our full richness of human experience, avatars can be a little bit problematic. Now, we know what the metaverse is, right? The creation of a metaverse in these imaginary spaces is obligatory. Now, of course, uh, not all of these metaverses require us to create avatars that are of ourselves directly, but this really, interest, this really poses a very interesting question, which is the following. Up until now, in any virtual space, we've had the option, pretty much for the most part, except you know, things like Second Life, we've had the ability to present ourselves in our own way and to have full control over how we present ourselves whether that means a profile photo or some sort of an image that we present of ourselves. We've had 100% control over that. But what happens when the little knobs and dials that we use to dictate 
what those appearances look like, what those appearances look like on social media or so on and so forth, become controlled in a very, very rigid way by corporations and by companies. Avatars force us to really grapple with these serious questions around how we picture ourselves, how we idealize ourselves, and how we derive our identities, both living and virtual. And avatars can actually be a really, really bad thing. Is a metaverse where we boost certain identities over others, one that we want to accept, let alone inhabit? I want to share a story uh, that you can read in full in my book, Immersive Content and Usability, where I talk about some of the challenges around the metaverse. Um, I was at South by Southwest last year in Austin, Texas. And we had just finished um, a panel about accessibility and inclusion within the context of voice technology, immersive technology, some of these uh, new things that are coming out. This is just a little bit before uh, AI became such a big buzzword in the most recent time around. A few colleagues and I, we went to a demo booth. And this demo booth in the exhibit hall, as some of you may know, in Austin, they have this massive uh, demo booth, this huge exhibit hall where all these sponsors uh, show up, all these startups will show up and, and demo their products. Very, very exciting. A lot of people uh, love that. There was one company in particular that seemed very interesting to us because it showed how we could actually generate our own avatars based on pictures of our faces and certain biometric data, certain things like our height, our weight, age, things of that nature. Now, you can probably imagine where things go sideways very quickly. Uh, one of these colleagues was uh, uh, my friend Molly Bloom. And uh, Molly Bloom is a wheelchair user, a accessibility activist. Uh, she's somebody that I look, to, look up to immensely for her writing on this topic of accessibility on the web and also um, at conferences, so on and so forth. Um, and I want to quote this story of hers in full here. I pushed up to the demo and took an image of my face and entered my biometric data, including my height and weight. The algorithm went to work, and there I was, an exceptionally slender, incredibly pale, straight-haired person with two legs in a trendy outfit, no wheelchair in sight. What I saw was an odd reflection of the person that I've worked hard to appreciate. First, I am by no means slender. Rather, I'm a combination of muscular and plump. The calculation of body size and stature from weight, height that the technology used failed because a substantial portion of my body, leg, buttock, ha hip, half of my pelvis, had been amputated. Therefore, average measures of body, like body mass index, BMI, are meaningless for me and many of my disabled friends. Second, my skin is by no means as smooth as a soft focus filter made me appear. Third, though I longed for straight hair as a child, my hair is curly and more often than not frizzy. Finally, I have not had two legs for the last 15 years of my life. The impact of viewing my avatar might have been jarring if I was not used to the mismatch between my experience and how technology producers imagine the humans who will use their products. I have worked tirelessly to appreciate my plumpness, my blemishes, my frizzy hair, and especially my one-legged, wheelchair-using, disabled badassness. I could not help but smile at the irony of coming from such thought-provoking discussions about equity and technology to this dystopian future in production. The work that I put into finding a peel in a body that does not fit standard beauty norms was erased in a matter of seconds by a technology that had not been designed so a person like me could feel comfortable about who they are. Here are a few pictures from this startup in particular. Now, I don't want to call out just pin screen here because this is true of many different AI avatar or AI startups that do this sort of work. But one thing that you might notice from these avatars is the complete lack of other aspects of diversity. Certainly you have ethnic and racial diversity. Certainly you might have gender diversity here. Certainly you have diversity potentially when it comes to uh, weight and height. But do you really have diversity when it comes to lived experience? Do you really have diversity when it comes to somebody who wants to see themselves in the way that they do and not in the way that you, as somebody who's creating this technology, wants to see them? I share Molly's story because in light of what happened with Horizon Worlds and the, the phrase, the post, legs are coming soon, um, I found that incredibly ironic given where we are today with avatars in general. As I shared with this story, avatars designed based on biases can limit how we perceive ourselves. They can actually serve to hurt our self-image and the ways that we think about who we are as human beings. In that way, machines can limit our humanity. 
But these biases that we write into our code, like for example, the, the ableist bias that prevented this AI startup from thinking about and considering the fact that there might be somebody who might want a wheelchair using avatar, this also affects how we perceive others. Think about voice assistants, for example. Voice assistants truly impact the way that we perceive each other. And what happens when we allow machines to define how we perceive each other? Well, the really great thing about assistance is that they allow us to save time. We can do things much more quickly. We can set a timer. We can play music. We can turn on and off lights. We can do really cool things with assistance that we couldn't do back when we had Clippy. Um, and by the way, I don't know about you all, but I actually kind of miss Clippy. Because guess what? Clippy was like the first example of a truly gender neutral, like non-binary, uh, virtual assistant that didn't have any sort of weird things or weird characteristics about it that made it seem really out of place, right? So I don't know. Am, am I alone in missing Clippy, by the way? Who misses Clippy, right? Yeah, there we go. Everyone misses Clippy. That's good. That's the thing. I mean, I, you know, I even missed this. Would you like some assistance today? Like, it's a great phrase. It's a great sentence. So one of the questions that I answered recently, uh, this was about six years ago, by the way. So some of you have seen this before, especially those of you who have seen my, my talks in the Drupal community. Um, but I do want to talk about one project that I had uh, the ability to work on, but actually extend a little bit of that discussion. Now, this project is something that happened about seven years ago. And um, you can read more about it in my book, Voice Content Usability. And it has a direct relationship to Drupal, by the way. So this is not completely off topic. So we already have an example of an assistant. Um, speaking of the experiences of disabled people in uh, technology, we already have a low-level example of an assistant, quote unquote, which is a screen reader. Obviously, for, for the blind community, for uh, low vision people, the screen reader is one of the easiest ways to interact with a website. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the implications that we're seeing on, of AI on uh, this notion of accessibility as well. But one of the things that we know about screen readers is that for blind and low vision people, uh, screen readers are actually not so great. Um, as Aaron Gustafson writes, as long as you have mechanisms that translate visual design constructs like proximity, proportion, et cetera, into useful information, then you have an effective screen reader experience. But there's just one problem, right? A lot of studies have shown and a lot of direct evidence shows that screen readers are very difficult to use and are way too verbose. They're way too talkative. They're way too loquacious for the vast majority of use cases that most people are using them for. And Chris Mari, who's a blind technologist and writes a lot about uh, using the web as a blind user, uh, talks about the experience that he has using screen readers, which is, from the beginning, I hated the way that screen readers work. Why are they designed the way they are? It makes no sense to present uh, information visually and then and only then translate that into audio. All the time and energy that goes into creating the perfect user experience for an app is wasted or even worse. So in response to this, uh, one of the projects I had a, uh, the opportunity to work on about six or seven years ago was a Alexa skill for Georgia.gov, which is a, the website for the state of Georgia, built on Drupal, by the way. And what we wanted to do was to address this problem of screen readers, because one of the things that we had heard from um, georgia.gov users was that using a screen reader to navigate through the georgia.gov website was very cumbersome. And also, a lot of elderly Georgians were not able to access information very quickly because of their, their, um, uh, uh, their inexperience with web tools and technology. So what we did is we created an Ask Georgia Cov, Ask Georgia Gov Alexa interface that basically helps you by letting you answer a question. And it's all based on the content that we see here. Um, and this is all content that's been created in the Drupal site, that is managed in the Drupal site, that stays up to date with the Drupal site um, and allows for anyone to ask questions that are, re are relevant to the state of Georgia, like how to transfer an out-of-state license into the state, how to register to vote, so on and so forth. Now, as you can imagine, these questions are being answered today in a lot of cases by ChatGPT. We're not sure if ChatGPT is getting them right, but more on that later. So <clears throat> the thing that we did here was to create a, a really compelling Alexa skill um, that at the time was the very first ever Amazon Alexa skill, very first ever voice interface for a state government institution. Um, at the time, because it was only about six months after the uh, Alexa skills kit had been released, um, we were very early to the game, and we also ended up having a, a skill that was quite good, but wasn't perfect. Um, we had about an 80% success rate on all interactions, and about 71.2% of all interactions led to the agency phone number, the state agency phone number being provided. 
the reason I tell this story is not actually about all of this. There's one particular anecdote that I've told many times over the course of the last few years when I share the experience of this, um, this actual implementation, which was, of course, a headless Drupal, decoupled Drupal implementation. And that is when we did usability testing and we launched. <clears throat> One of the things that we gave to the state of Georgia and the Georgia.gov team was a logging mechanism in the, uh, in the reporting structure of their website uh, administration where they could see 404 errors based on searches that had not actually worked, that had not actually led to a real result. And one of the things that kept on popping up over and over again was this word right here, this proper noun, Lawson's. And we kind of asked ourselves, what could possibly be triggering this? Why is it that we keep seeing this error pop up over and over again with a 404 error? Later on, uh, one of the native Georgians in the room, uh, she had a eureka moment, and she said, well, Lawson's is just Amazon Alexa mishearing the word license in a southern Georgia drawl. So Lawson's, of course, is correct in the view of this dialect, right, from Georgia, which is, of course, the citizenry that we're serving, the people that we're serving, they deserve to have their accent heard, their dialect heard by uh, Amazon Alexa. Every time I've told this story, it's gotten the same kind of laughs that it got today. But lately, I've been thinking about this story in a different light. And I've been recasting a lot of the experience that I had with this project in a different light, now that it's been six or seven years since this was released, and about five years since it was decommissioned, or three years since it was decommissioned. The fact of the matter is, is that, why is that such a funny thing? Well, here's a question I want to ask today, which is, who do you picture when you listen to these voices? When you talk to Siri, when you talk to Alexa, Cortana, if you ride Amtrak and you talk to Julie, who's the customer support provider, uh, AI support provider for Amtrak in the United States, who do you picture and who do you hear? Who is it that you're imagining in your head? When you hear them speak, what is that person, who is that person that you're seeing in front of you as they speak? Going back to the issue of human identity, these assistants are very austere, right? When you think about talking to a phone hotline back in the day, those voices were disembodied, horribly, uncannily, valley-like, right? But the problem with the human identity is that it comes at a cost, as we've seen already with avatars. One of the problems, especially with assistants, is that the way that we think of them, the way that we identify them from the very get-go is misogynistic and is sexist. Because our society perceives and portrays executive assistants and the types of people who fill this role in our lives today only as secretarial women. And this pervades every single aspect of the most common assistants, including how we talk to them. Now, let me raise my hand and, and, and ask this question. Don't be ashamed. How many of you have said, shut up to Alexa in your house? Or have said something like, Shh, stop talking, right? Now, this is very common. But the thing is, one of the things that's happening here is twofold, right? We've got, number one, deeply held biases are already prejudicing us in favor of how we perceive one type of assistant over another, how we think about how an assistant, how an AI assistant that shouldn't care less, that doesn't care less about what we think of them, should actually portray themselves. And then second, we're actually having those biases reflected back to us. Because when we actually say those things, when we say things like shut up to a virtual assistant, and we have our children by our side listening, what we're actually doing is we're telling these children, we're telling those around us that it's okay to treat these machines this way. And by extension, could that mean that we're saying potentially that it's okay to treat people that way? The attributes that we bestow on speech synthesizers and assistants to establish this identity may in fact worsen the oppression that many of us face on a daily basis. Now, there's a historical legacy here, right? There's the fact that um, straight cisgender white men were generally the first ones who made the interactive voice response systems that govern the, va the vast majority of phone hotlines before the year 2010. It's no surprise that most of these voice assistants are, to the user's ears, straight cisgender white women who speak in a general American dialect. But when I thought about that result that we got in a different light, I thought again and again about why it was that that story about the word Lawson's was so funny, I thought, there is that light-hearted side, but there's also a darker side. 
which is that, frankly, the chances are that that person who said license in the way that she knows how to say license was actually feeling that her experience was diminished because of the fact that Amazon does not recognize that particular dialect. And we see this everywhere, not only in how we interact with our assistants and our voice algorithms, but also how we interact with each other in society. There's no space for dialects like Indian English, for example, or Black English, or AAVE in our societies. There's no space, it seems like, on these voice assistants for people who speak English as a second language, for trans people who speak English in a different language, or code switch between different modes of speech. When was the last time you spoke with a voice assistant that made a mistake while speaking English or while speaking German? It's never happened, right? And what does that do to the way that we think about how perfectionist we are when it comes to our expectations of how people speak our language in society, especially when there is already so much anti-immigrant hate happening in Europe and in the United States today. A lot of food for thought. And this is why I believe that assistants should re represent the richness of human language. They should be just like us. They should be just like every one of us that struggles to speak German, especially even those of us who have lived in Austria for many years and still struggle uh, with the Austrian-German dialect. It's a hard one. This is the problem, right? Many of us here in this room, we struggle with, or many of our friends and family struggle with using a perfect, pristine, mistakeless form of the language that we operate in. But it seems like we're encoding in these devices inadvertently and without actually intending to, unintentionally, we're actually encoding in these devices a bias against these dialects spoken by immigrants, spoken by people of color that we hear today. It's considered a flaw, a blemish, an issue to be resolved rather than an achievement. I'm a person of color. I'm also uh, a descendant of immigrants, and I have uh, a family member um, who struggles with speaking English. Now, she is entirely fluent. She is 100% fluent in American English. She is able to be understood. She can understand everything. But she has an accent. She has a dialect that she uses when she speaks. One of the things that she often tells me is, well, within our community, within our smaller family gatherings, I hear people who sound like us. But when I go outside, when I talk to people at work, when I experience racism and discrimination solely because of how I speak a language that I am fluent in, that's something else. And that's something that we're actually seeing reflected black back to us in our technologies. So I want to ask uh, every one of you here today, what language do you speak non-natively? Do you hear that form of that non-natively spoken language reflected back to you in your interactions with voice assistants and with other speech technologies? And if not, why not? Why is that such a thing that we don't see? Because ignoring these dialects, ignoring this richness that's inherent to how we use languages and how we struggle and fight to be able to be understood in German or English or French or what have you, it makes those dialects in particular continue to appear inferior, and that allows xenophobia and anti-immigrant sentiment to persist. And we see how this has happened uh, over the years in the United States as well when it comes to denigrating um, African-American vernacular English or black English as Ebonics, calling it something that is inferior, saying that it is uneducated English. It's not uneducated English. It is still just as valid and just as correct a form of English. Why don't we make our technology show that too? There's also this debate about the conversational singularity that very soon here, especially with things like ChatGPT, um, these voice interfaces are going to become indistinguishable from natural human conversation. But at what cost? Natural for whom? Conversation for whom? And a singularity for whom exactly? There's an article that just appeared in the New York Times. The New York Times, by the way, has been on fire the last week or so with uh, articles about AI and about some of the issues that I'm talking about today. There's this article right here about um, a call center worker whose job is being replaced uh, by AI. To many people, chatbots and other technology feel like a ticking time bomb should explode their work. That's why I think I feel terrified. I'm not sure about you. But to some, the threat is already here. Unfortunately, the reins and levers that govern AI and conversational technologies, they're still in the hands of the wealthy and the privileged few, in the hands of these very large corporations that really don't have our best interests at heart. 
And unfortunately, mass layoffs are already occurring of customer service agents and call center staffers around the world, many of them in low and middle income countries, countries that were victims of imperialism and colonization. And this is already happening at a very, very fast pace. What are we doing for them? What are we doing to protect them in this society? Artificial intelligence is one of the ways that that's happening. But artificial intelligence is really impacting and influencing, I think, the way that we're interacting with the world around us and how we interact with everybody else in society today, notwithstanding the fact that we have social media algorithms that change how we interact with each other and so on and so forth. There was this New York Times article that just appeared yesterday. Actually, I think it might still be on the front page today about the worries that have happened. Now, there's been a lot of articles, a lot of news recently about AI startups who are worried about their own creation. Um, OpenAI worries about what its chatbot will say about people's faces. Now, I highly recommend reading this full article because it really touches out a lot of the themes that I've talked about today. But this article is very interesting because it discusses some of the things that we have to think about when it comes to the future of generative AI. Now, there's a version of ChatGPT out there right now uh, that's available for blind people. And it allows for uh, basically anyone to analyze an image through text. So you, get, you put in an image, and you get something out of it that is a textual representation of that image, um, which is a very, very huge advancement, especially uh, for those of us who are you know, wanting a little bit of help to write alt text, for instance. But one of the issues that OpenAI has been facing with this new uh, service that's available for uh, the blind community is that it analyzes faces and people as well. It actually looks at traits and characteristics of individual people. And as a matter of fact, they discovered through their testing of this, through their beta testing of this, that it can actually recognize people's identities and their individual features. So it can pick out people in a crowd and say, that is Nicolas Sarkozy or that is so-and-so, or that is Dries Beitart, right? Now, the thing that's really challenging about this, of course, is notwithstanding, of course, the impact on surveillance and so on and so forth, what does that actually mean for how we are going to end up perceiving each other? Because right now, this version of this product doesn't identify anything about race, doesn't identify anything about other features that might be considered inferior in today's oppressive society. But in the future, a lot of other AI products might end up doing those things inadvertently. And there's a quote in this article from Ethan Mollick, who's an associate professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania, who says, AI is just blowing through all the things that are supposed to separate humans from machines, which I felt was a very perfect encapsulation of this talk today. Who remembers the, the Bing fiasco from uh, like six, six months ago now, right? Everyone remember this? The, the, uh, hallucinations and the unhinged quote-unquote personality that Bing had. Um, so it's funny because I feel like this, everyone saw this and then it kind of just disappeared. Like we forgot this happened. There's like a collective amnesia about this whole thing now that, you know, we've seen ChatGPT come to the forefront. But one of the things that I find very, very interesting about this um, particular example is that blurring of that line between humanity and machine, between human and machine. Because if you read this text, and if you read this thinking that it's a real person, you can understand just how much of a gray area we are in, just how much of a deep water, scary wilderness we are in right now with the technologies that we're experimenting with. The problem, of course, with generative AI, and this is something that many people have called out, many of the uh, foremost AI thinkers of color especially have actually come out with essays talking about this, but generative AI, large language models, these are both trained on data that shows bias to begin with. It's already leading to some of those same issues that we've seen with algorithmic racism and racist machine vision. For example, the fact that we have facial recognition that automatically identifies a darker skin tone as somebody who is more likely to be a criminal. Or, for example, that famous story of that soap dispenser in a hotel that couldn't detect dark skin. Bias that presents in these responses, and of course these AI hallucinations that we might falsely trust rooted in bias, can lead to even more harmful outcomes for those who already experience oppression in society today. And generative AI is already also taking the jobs of some of these workers who can least afford it. Countries that are experiencing hyperinflation, like Argentina and Turkey, they are those witnessing the highest rates of adoption for day-to-day -day tasks. 
One of my closest friends, um, she is an owner of a marketing agency in Turkey, in Istanbul. And uh, she told me recently, she told me a, just, just, just a couple months ago, that um, because of the currently ongoing economic crisis in Turkey, but also because of the advent of ChatGBT, she has lost every single one of her clients. She has zero customers right now. She has had to shut down her operations for the time being because every single one of her customers has gone to ChatGPT to help them write marketing copy, to help them create advertisements, to help them with SEO. None of them see any value in paying somebody for those services anymore. And if you think that's only happening in those countries and won't happen here, it is going to happen here very soon and already is right now. And this is why we see, for example, the writer's strike and the actor's strike happening right now in Hollywood. Now, a lot of us are laughing because, you know, <laughs> these are writers and actors, you know, but if you listen to their concerns and if you read some of their essays and their manifestos that they've come out with, there's some really important concerns in here. First and foremost is what happens to writers when you could just get ChatGPT to generate a whole screenplay for you or write a whole movie for you or write a whole TV show for you? And what happens to actors, especially those of us who, uh, those actors who are background actors, those who are extras in movies or play small bit parts, what happens to those when you can actually generate digital AI manifestations of actors' faces and actors' mannerisms and personalities and not have to pay them ever again for their services? These strikes that are ongoing right now point to a very dark future, not just for writers and actors and creatives and those artists in our midst who produce compelling work on a daily basis, they also pose important and pressing questions for us as technologists, for us as designers, and for us as developers. Because like it or not, artificial intelligence is already affecting workers like you and me around the world. Now, who saw uh, Wix.com just announce about a week ago or two ago that they're adding an AI plugin into their service? Yeah, so if you haven't seen it yet, Wix, the website builder, is now allowing you to basically you know, have it design a whole website for you using AI using a text prompt. Now, this is the, the future that was predicted by thegrid.io. This was a startup that appeared about 10 years ago uh, to do the very same thing. They just got the timing wrong. But this points to a very, very urgent and kind of depressing question for all of us here in this room, which is how soon are we going to see this, those same things that happened that affected those call center workers, that affected my friend in Turkey, that affected so many that we've already seen how soon is that coming to our doorstep, and how are we going to prepare for that? So what can and should we do? And by the way, I don't want to end this on a light that is a sad ending, because I do think that we have the ability to make a difference. Number one is we need to advocate true inclusion and equity at work. One of the biggest reasons why we're seeing these problems appear is because we don't have enough women. We don't have enough non-binary people. We don't have enough trans people. We don't have enough queer people. We don't have enough black people and people of color in our teams and in our companies to help us look for and identify these biases. We also need to make sure to think about those biases and ideas within ourselves. Second, support AI regulation. Right now, the EU is working on AI regulation. Support open source, support open source models and open web models for AI. Make sure that we can see all of these things happening transparently. And third, uh, unionize. Create a union, start a union, and support unionization in tech. Because if you don't think that this is going to come and hurt us, it's, it will very, very soon. And even those of us who are protected from our relative safety in the midst of technology will actually be damaged and be impacted by this very, very soon. Collective bargaining does work. Um, we can protect uh, the weakest of us, the, 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 the most unfortunate of us, those who need the most help in our midst by starting a union. By the way, I want to plug one of my friend's uh, books here, uh, my dear friend and colleague, Ethan Marcotte, who is also the uh, guy who came up with responsive web design. Um, he just came out with a new book called You Deserve a Tech Union. It's coming out from my publisher, A Book Apart, in just a month. I highly recommend it. I haven't read more than a little bit of it, but I do uh, believe that it's a phenomenal book. Ethan's a great author. Um, so if you'd like to learn more about tech unions and how to start a union, I'd definitely recommend looking up his book. And here's some questions to ask. I don't want to dwell on these. Um, I'll share the slides out later. But um, you know, one of the things that I want to ask all of us is, how can we best make sure that we don't become 
inhuman ourselves, that we don't become like the machines that are going, that are going to take, us, take, take over from us, and also that serve to clone our hate and serve to clone our biases. Some key takeaways before I turn to questions. Now, by giving, us, by giving up more control, by surrendering more control over our ability to define ourselves with the full richness, the full spectrum of who we are, whether that means our use of a wheelchair, whether that means our skin color, whether that means our fatness, whether that means our disability, whether that means our neurodivergence, by giving up more and more control over that fine-grained ability to define who we are as human, we're losing what makes us human. And we see this with avatars. We see this with voice assistants. We see this with AI. By becoming more like the machines that we've created, we're actually exposing ourselves to our own coding of hate, our own algorithms of oppression, our own architecture of bias. So in order to fix our machines, we have to first fix ourselves. Machines, they can't tell us how to perceive ourselves. They can't tell us how to perceive each other. They can't tell us how to perceive everyone in our midst. We can't rely on machines to tell us how to be human. We can only rely on each other to tell us how to be human. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. So for Q&A, um, I think I need to give this microphone up, right? Is that correct? And then I can grab this microphone, I think, right? Any questions in the room? Wink harder if you're winking. <laughs> Thanks, Preston. Uh, to the ever elusive questions about <laughs> uh, to the ever elusive question about Clippy and how we all want Clippy to be back. Uh, don't you think that actually uh, looking at the shiny things, be it uh, very accessible Chat GPT interface or Clippy itself, give us into the uh, into the loop? Hall where we actually have this chat box on the side of the website that never gets you anywhere or calling a bank in an emergency and have, have to press six different numbers six times until you get to somewhere to get an attendance. Don't, don't you think we actually we're asking for those things and then we blame them ourselves? Uh, is there, uh, so the question is, should there be more education in terms of what, uh, uh, where we have to trade off the shiny things versus the actually functional things and what the functional help from the artificial intelligence or uh, digital assistance um, there can be and what level we should be able to quickly access versus uh, the actually emergency situations. That's a very good question. Um, and that gets to, I think, some of the raging debate and some of the challenging questions here, right? Which is, um, you know, number one, we have obviously a desire to speed up and accelerate how we find information, how we get our problems solved. Uh, I think that's a very, very core uh, human need. Um, and I do think that there is a place, for example, for uh, ChatGPT to solve those problems for us, for even those annoying, you know, lower right hand corner pop ups that ask us if, they wanna, if we wanna buy their product. Um, I, there, there is a role for them. Um, I do think, however, that, 
education, as you said, is important. I do think that it's important to tell people, you know, what we're doing here is we're actually serving to uh, potentially reduce the, the efficacy of the responses you're getting, and also to reduce, obviously, the, the workforce of those who might most need this, this uh, job. But there's interesting kind of debate about this as well. So I read it, um, there's a study that came out about voice assistance where um, there was this uh, study that asked the question of, do people prefer to talk to something that they know is a machine and not human? Do they prefer to talk to them as they would another person? As in somebody that you're calling on a hotline after you get through the various menus and you actually get to speaking to a human being. Do people actually want to talk to a bot or talk to a chat GPT that way? Uh, or to a voice bot in, in this case? And what's interesting is that um, that study showed that a lot of people actually, most people actually prefer to use a more artificial form of speaking, to use a more mechanical form of speaking instead of a more, you know, sort of human or organic way of speaking, because it helps them to kind of keep in their minds that this is not actually a real human being. So I think the real question, in addition to um, what you asked there, Vladimir, is the real question is, where do we want to draw that line between what is somebody who is a human being and what is somebody who is a machine? Because if we draw that line, then we avoid some of the problems that we might see around people uh, misidentifying a machine as human, for example, uh, which is, I think, uh, a concern that's seen uh, more, and more and more in science fiction, but will become more and more of a real concern soon. Um, and also begs the question of, is there potentially a middle road where we provide an alternative path for those who still want to interact with machines in this less human way um, while still also uh, you know, retaining the access to information that they want? Um, it's a very challenging question. I, I don't personally think that it's, I, I don't personally think that we're going to be able to, to actually prevent uh, this future that I think we're, you, you and I both are kind of predicting, I don't think, it, I think, I don't think we're going to prevent it. I think people are, are increasingly going to trust these bots and these chatbots, um, especially those of us who are, who are younger and are, and are newer to technology. I think we're going to increasingly trust these um, chatbots and assistants more and more, and uh, the line will continue to blur unless we, we really educate and, and make sure that people understand uh, the difference very clearly. Thank you. So I think there was one question up in the back. There are multiple there. I think there was someone there earlier. Did I overlook you? Yes. So you talked about the problem of uh, various languages being supported by, or not supported by uh, voice assistants or uh, how you access or how you use them. So we can improve a lot on them in terms of technology, but I don't think that the, I don't think, I haven't seen a way, have you seen a way of technology solutions for improving the interaction patterns that we have with voice assistants? So part of the reason I avoid voice assistants in my household is because I don't want my six and eight year olds to get used to this. I ask for something and I get instant gratification for what I asked, to have that kind of interaction ingrained in them. Uh, with their, when I think about something, I ask about something and it happens immediately. And so they don't get used to this pattern with the rest, the other parts of their life. Um, and e even just, e even if I don't talk to the voice assistant rudely, there would still be a pattern there that, um, that I, I would try to avoid. So I don't see that there's a way around that. Yeah, um, I agree. And, and definitely what I've shared here is, um, uh, not realistic in terms of actually impacting the way that these algorithms work. Um, for example, speech synthesis um, and also how uh, we hear these um, other dialects or other forms of speech emerge um, are, are simply not things that we can affect. And especially now that a lot of them are, are just completely closed source and we're never going to be able to, to see them in an open source fashion. Um, so to, to, you know, to, to answer that part, I would say that you know, the only way to fix that really is to, you know, actually get into those places like Amazon, get into those places like Microsoft, get into places like Google, and, and form working groups or even unions that fight for this sort of thing and say, you know, we need to actually work on this uh, problem of inclusion within our technology, as many of the AI professionals at Google did 
um, with their open letter not so long ago. To your second question, though, to your second part, actually, uh, I share the same concern about instant gratification and, and sort of the, the, not just the ways in which voice assistants are changing the way that we perceive people and the way that we perceive language, but also the way that, we, that it actually rewires our brain. Um, I do think that technology today um, and you know, just everything, if you think about social media, if you think about how we navigate the web, even the web itself is in some ways a form of instant gratification because of the fact that we can look up anything and have results returned to us immediately and not go to a library, for example. Um, but I think that there are vast implications, especially when it comes to voice assistants, which are implicitly person uh, personified. They're implicitly anthropomorphized, right? They're implicitly beings that we consider people, right? Just like how we think about um, AI, for example, AI avatars or uh, chatbots. And I didn't even mention um, some of the AI avatars that, that, that are of people that don't even exist, that are just bots, that are just fronts for bots, facades for bots. The question that we have to ask ourselves is, how much does this introduction of inhumanity into our children, into our minds, into our mental health, um, is going to really, really mess up not only the trajectory of ourselves already as adults, but also those of our children? Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so I agree with you 100%, Kabla. I think we can do one more. I will pass this in. Well, um, what's your, you've talked about like uh, how AI can, it's going to hurt quite a lot of jobs. And I think as developers, a lot of our jobs involve optimizing, which a lot of the time means hurting other people's jobs. So AI is kind of doing it faster. Do you think your, what's your feeling about the net overall, like in, in 30, 40 years time, do you think it will have created more jobs or hurt more jobs? Oh. <laughs> that is a great question. Um, so just this morning, I was reading, um, I was reading uh, uh, The Verge, um, and th there was this really interesting article that was on there today about how um, essentially the, the changes that we're seeing with AI are not only going to open up uh, job opportunities when it comes to prompt engineering and all of that, as we've seen, uh, but also different, different sorts of jobs um, that will you know, allow for people to be freed up in a sense so that they can work these other jobs. I'm personally not so optimistic. Um, and, and, I, and, and part of the reason why I'm not so optimistic is because of the economic structures that we have in place today. Um, the fact that we live in a, in a very capitalist society and the fact that so many people, when they do not, when they no longer have access to the opportunity that they've gained because of AI, they have no access to anything else because of how their uh, economy is structured or their, how, how their workforce is structured um, is something that is, is a very, very major concern for me. So my hope is actually, and this is an answer to your question that is maybe a little bit, um, maybe I'll get some rotten tomatoes thrown at me right now, but um, what I believe needs to happen, actually I think this is a friendly audience for this, uh, what I think needs to happen is what so many of the early people who wrote about the impact of AI on work on the future of work have said, which is what we really need is um, to reap the benefits of AI collectively, to allow for those who are unemployed, who are unable to work because of AI, we need to guarantee them a universal basic income. And in so doing, we need to also allow for people to um, work more creatively, to, to self-actualize, to do things that are more in line with and in alignment with what they would actually like to be doing creatively or, or, or for their human spirit. Um, and let's let AI take over more of the work, but let's not put more work on ourselves. Let's not take somebody out of a job and then expect them to work a different job. Let's, let's go ahead and, and, and reinvent the future of work, reinvent this culture of work, reinvent capitalism, um, and, and give people a, a different way of life. Now in 30, 40 years, do I think that will happen? Um, I don't, uh, and, and that is my pessimistic side. As I've told you all, I'm, I'm terrified, I am, I am scared. This is something I, I have nightmares about all the time. Um, but I do think that in 30, 40 years, we're gonna be in the same boat. I think a lot of us will have upskilled, reskilled, changed uh, our careers to um, sort of navigate through this. But unless we all sort of rise up politically and, and think about the ways in which we can, we can um, uh, create this better future, create this UBI, create this 
uh, future of work that we want. I personally don't see the next 30, 40 years being any more different than the last 30, 40 years have been. Thank you all so much. I think that was, that was it, right? Okay. Dankeschön.